Shalom, Bruchim Abayim, and Walk in the Shevi Impani in the Torah to the 70 faces of the Torah and also Sulam Yaakov. I would like to once again extend a heartfelt greeting to everyone and say Lashana Tova, Happy New Year, and Chag Sameach, Happy Holidays, as we officially enter in the year 5782 with the observance of Rosh Hashanah. For Rosh Hashanah, I have prepared a special set of teachings. So far, I have released one teaching that was called the Divine Eye of Judgment. And as a part of that teaching, I have subtitled this teaching, The Book of Your Soul. Now, this teaching is actually based off of a famous Maimar Chazal that mentions that there are three books that are open before Hashem during this hour. There is the Book of the Complete Wicked, the Book Book of the Complete Righteous, and also the Book of the Benonim, the actual individuals who are in between being righteous and wicked. And so to spend effective time on that topic alone, which I did mention in my previous teaching, we take a look here in the Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah 16b, and which it says over there, it says three books are open on Rosh Hashanah before the Holy One, blessed be He. Once again, Echad Shel Roshayim Gemorlin, there is a book of the completely wicked. Echad Shel Sadekim Gemorlin, there is a book of the completely righteous. Echad Shel Benonim, and there is also a book open for the Benonim, those who are in between being righteous or wicked. And it says that the completely righteous are immediately written and sealed for life. The completely wicked are immediately written and sealed for death. And the Benonim, well, they are left with their judgment suspended from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. And it says their faith remaining undecided. It says if they are Zoche, they merit, they merit, excuse me. It says through the good deeds and mitzvot that they perform during this period, in other words, the 10 days of all, it says they are written for life. But if they are not Zoche, well, Chasis Chalila, God forbid, they are then written for death. Okay, what are these books exactly? Where do we find the concept of these three books in the Torah? If we take a look at the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, we discover that there are passages with a scripture that do refer to books of judgment. For example, over in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 9 through 10, it alludes to a set of books that are open regarding judgment. Daniel records over there, I watch as thrones were set up. And the one who is the Va'atich Yomim, the Ancient of Days, was there sitting. And it says his garment was white as snow, and his hair like clean wool. Now you should know that you should not read these things literal. These are metaphors, by the way, because Daniel's having a vision. So it's not literal. And it says his throne was of fiery flames, its wheels blazing fire. It says a stream of fire flowing forth from before him, a thousand thousands were serving him, and a myriad myriads were standing before him. So here Daniel is alluding to the different categories of angels in the higher realms. And it mentions over here that the judgment, Dina Yitiv, Vesivrin Pitichu, that the judgment was set and books were opened. Once again, what are these books? Furthermore, if we go over to Sefer Tehillim, David Amelech asks Hashem, not to ascribe the wicked with the righteous in the Book of Life. We read there in Tehillim 69, 29. It says, May they be erased from the Book of Life. And let them not be inscribed with the righteous. Once again, where are these three books in the Torah? David alludes to it, so we have a passage in the Ketavim. Daniel was also in the Ketavim as well. He's not a Navi in the sense of the Nevi'im portion because he did not experience the gift of Nevoah as a Navi would. In other words, a vision, a trance, things of that nature. He had an open vision. But nonetheless, we do see that there are allusions to some type of books that seem to be associated with judgment. What is this all about? If we continue reading the Gemara, Chazal explains the meaning of these three books. We continue here in Rosh Hashanah 16b, and we're going to read two different interpretations. The first kind of interpretation is brought down by Rav Avin, and Rav Avin said, what is the pasuk or verse that alludes to this? In other words, to the three books. He says in Psalm 69.29, which is the passage we just got done quoting, when it says over there, that let them be blotted out of the book of the living, 
but not be written with the righteous. Rav Avin said, let them be blotted out of the book. In other words, that statement, this alludes to the book of the completely wicked. And it says afterwards, those people are blotted out from the world. And it says of the living, well, this is the book of the completely righteous. However, when it goes on to say, Ve'in sadakin el yikatevu, but let them not be written with the righteous, well, this refers to the book of the Benoni, who are written in a separate book, not with the righteous, because obviously their faith hasn't been determined yet. They're not considered a Sadiq. The outcome of the meaning of Sadiq has not been decided by Hashem. We continue to go on. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak comes along and he says, well, the matter is actually derived from the Pasuk that we find in Parashat in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32, and which here, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak is going to call for Moshe Rabbeinu when Hashem says he's going to annihilate the Jewish people. And Moshe, therefore, he says to Hashem that, no, he says that you should macheni na misifracha. Therefore, blot me, I pray you, out of your book, which you have written. Blot me, I pray you, okay? Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak says, well, this refers to the book of the completely wicked who are blotted out from the world. And it says, out of your book, your book, well, this alludes to the book of the completely righteous, which is a special and attributed to God himself. And it says, which you have written. Well, this refers to the Benoni, the book of the Benoni. Interesting. If we look to Chazal to show us where we find the three books of the Sadikim, Rosh'im, and Benonim in the Torah, we can actually, we actually cannot find a direct passage or chapter. Instead, what we see in this Gemara is there's two different explanations that are brought down by Rav Avin and Rav Nachman Bar Yitzach. Rav Adin, Avin, excuse me, Darshan's proof of the three books from the passage in Tehillim 69-29, Rav Nachman Darshan's proof of the three books from the passage in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. When we analyze Rav Avin and Rav Nachman's understanding of the three books via the passages in Psalm 69-29 and Exodus 32-32, it raises a few questions to our understanding of these three books. First, most people when they hear about the three books, they have a perception of that when it comes to judgment of Rosh Hashanah, that Hashem inscribes the righteous for life. In other words, so-and-so, Poloni ben Poloni, has fulfilled this mitzvah, has fulfilled that mitzvah, and therefore they are Sadiq and they are inscribed for life. Poloni ben Poloni, so-and-so over here, well, that person is not so much of a Sadiq, more they're a Rasha, and therefore they committed this Avera and they committed that Avera, and therefore they are inscribed for death. And the faith of the Benonim, those who are neither righteous or wicked, well, their faith will be determined on Yom Kippur by the time we get to the, uh, to the Nila, to the closing of the gate service. The problem with this perception is that it's not supported by Chazal. What do I mean it's not supported by Chazal? Did not the Gemara just explain that the three books correspond to the wicked, the righteous, and the Benonim? Right? Isn't that not what the actual Gemara just mentioned? We go back here to Rosh Hashanah 16b. It says three books are open at Rosh Hashanah before the Holy One, blessed be He. Right? One book over here is Sadikin Gemurim, completely righteous. Ve'echad, the other book shall, uh, or excuse me, Rosh Gemurim, one for the wicked, one for the righteous, and also Ve'echad Shel Benonim, and one for the in between. And it says, holy righteous people are immediately written and sealed for life, while the completely wicked people are immediately written and sealed for death. And the Benoni, well, they're left with their judgment suspended from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur, their faith remaining undecided. If they're Zohe, through the good deeds and mitzvot that they perform during this period, in other words, the 10 days of awe, well, then they are written for life. But if they are not Zohe, well, God forbid, once again, they are written for death. So, you mean to tell me that this is not what the sages mean? Well, what do they mean then? The Gemara's teaching of the three books is not isolated, but is based on the Mishnah's description of creation passing before Hashem on Rosh Hashanah 
as Kivne Maron. We go back here to the Mishnah Rosh Hashanah 1 2, which is what I discussed in my previous teaching. The Gemara is building off of this, trying to explain what this Mishnah means. And just for review of what we learned in our previous teaching, it says, On Rosh Hashanah, all the people of the world, they pass before Hashem like Kivne Maron. And we learned what that meant. It means division of soldier, or it can mean Kivne Marana, means like sheep, right? And it says the proof text of this is once again from Psalm chapter 33, verse 15, that says, Hayotzer Yechad Libam, that he who fashions all the hearts, the hearts of them all, Hamevin El Kol Masehem, who discerns all of their doings. So when we look at the Mishnah here, we do not see anything about three books. So how is it that the Gemara comes along and mention that there are three books that are open on Rosh Hashanah, and that the three books correspond either to the Roshayin Gemurim, Sadikin Gemurim, or Benoni. How in the world did the Gemara come up with that? Where does that come from? Now, once again, in my previous teaching on Rosh Hashanah, I mentioned the meaning of Kinei Maron from the Mishnah in context to Psalm 3315. If you did not get a chance to look at that teaching, please, after this teaching, go back and look at it because they both go hand in hand. Now, regarding the Gemara's explanation, when Rav Avin and Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak attempt to explain the meaning of the three books, we discover a completely different and, I would say, mind-altering understanding of the three books. When referring to the wicked, the emphasis of Rav Avin and Rav Nachman is that the wicked are not simply inscribed for death. In other words, so-and-so violated this mitzvah or that mitzvah, and therefore the chay of mita, they're, they're automatically worthy for death, they're going to die. Rather, the wicked are macha, they are erased, they are blotted out from the book of life. We go back here to Rosh Hashanah 16b, and this is over there once again. Rav Avin said, what is the pasuk, the verse that alludes to this? It says in Psalm 69:29, in which David Amelech says, Yimechu misefer chaim, let them be blotted out of the book of life, but not written with the righteous. And there is an explanation on these three things. Let them be blotted out of, Yimechu misefer of the book. Well, this book alludes to the Roshayim Gemorin, the completely wicked, who are blotted out from the world. Now, regarding chaim, of the living, well, that refers to the Sadikim uh, Gemurin, the completely righteous. And then it says, But do not be written, Ve'im Sadikim El Yikatevu, but do not be written with the righteous. Well, this alludes to the book of the Benoni. They are not yet righteous, therefore, they cannot be inscribed with the righteous. And then we go back to Rav Bar, uh, excuse me, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzach. And which he says, we learn a proof of the three books from the passage in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32, in which Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem after he says he was going to destroy the Jewish people, Therefore, blot me out, I pray to you, out of your book, which you have written. And therefore, Rav Nachman says, well, blot me out, okay, blot me out, please, well, this refers to the book of the completely wicked, okay, who are blotted out from the world. Out of Misefrecha, from out of your book, well, this is the book of the completely righteous, which is special and attributed to God Himself. And last but least, which you have written, this refers to the Beit Onim, that refers to the in-between people. Okay, interesting. Does not being blotted out from the book of life have the same connotation as being inscribed for death? In other words, the opposite of life is death. The difference is our perception of what is the Book of Life. Why does the Gemara go out the way to record two different rabbinical sources in understanding these three books on Rosh Hashanah? Once again, Rav Avin refers to the Pasuk in Sefer Dehillim, where David HaMelech speaks about the wicked being Yimachu mi Sefer Chaim, being blotted out the book of the living, but not inscribed with the righteous. Interesting. If you're blotted out of the book of the living, the book of life, which the righteous are associated with, how could you be inscribed with the righteous when the righteous are associated with the book of life? 
Doesn't make sense. David Amalek refers to the Book of Life. Book of Life. Where is this Book of Life at? Where? This is very important. A lot of people don't realize. And I've talked about this many times before. Any concepts that we find in the Nevi'im or the Ketavim, or even the words of Chazal themselves, must be found in the Chumash. Must be found in the five books of Moshe Rabbeinu. If we cannot validate an idea, a concept, an ideology, a hashkafa within the Torah, we can dismiss it. We don't have to accept it. Everything must be found in the Torah. The Nevi'im and the Ketavim, they do not have the same authority as the Torah. They are built off the Torah, but they do not have any authority within themselves. The only infallible Word of God is the five books of Moshe Rabbeinu. Everything after that is based off of the Torah. And if anything appears in those books that contradict the Torah, we can dismiss those books. So where is the Book of Life in the Torah? Where is it at? When the Gemara recorded Rav Nachman's interpretation to the three books, we just read that he referred to the passage in Exodus 32, verse 32. And there in that passage, we see Moshe asks Hashem to blot his name from out of his book. We go back to that passage in its entirety. Exodus 32, 32 to 33, we'll include verse 33. Ve'ata im chatatam, and now if you would but forgive their sin. Ve'im ein machenina misiflecha, but if not, erase me now from your book, Asher Katafta, that you have written. Vayomer Adonai, O Moshe, Hashem responds to Moshe. And he says, whoever has sinned against me, he says, Emecheinu misifri, I shall erase him from my book. Rav Nachman interprets this verse by explaining how the wicked are blotted out. We'll go back to this passage here of Rav Nachman Bar Yitzach. And he says here, this matter is derived once again from Exodus 32, verse 32, in which Moshe Rabbeinu says, Machini na, okay, na misafrecha, therefore blot me out, please, from your book. Okay, and here Rav Nachman interprets, blot me out, machini na, that refers to the book of the wicked, who are blotted out of the world. Out of your book, misafrecha, your book, well, this book here, when it refers to book, alludes to the completely righteous, which is special and attributed to God Himself. And last but least, the book that you have actually written, in which God Himself, or at least Moshe Rabbeinu, when He says, Katafta, that you have written, that means that is the book of the Benonim, that is the book of the in-between people. Okay. So based upon Rab Nachman Bar Yitzhak's interpretation, does this mean that Moshe was a Rasha, since according to Rab Nachman, the phrase Machenina alludes to the actual book of the Russian Im Gemurim? God forbid. We know Moshe was not a, a Rasha because in answering his request to be blotted out, Hashem told Moshe immediately in the next passage there, in verse 33 of chapter 32, he says, Mi asher chatatli, whoever sinned against me. God says, Emechenu misifli, I shall blot him out of my book. So this person will be blotted out of the book of Hashem. Interesting. What is Hashem's book? Hashem wrote a book. Where is this book at? It's only one book. It's the Sefer Torah. The Sefer Torah is the Eight Chaim. It's the Sefer Chaim. It is the Book of Life. Okay. If the Sefer Torah is the Book of Life, what does it mean to be blotted out of the Torah? Over at Masechet Ta'anit, Chazal teach that when a person stands before Hashem on the Day of Judgment, their soul will testify against him. We read there in Ta'anit 11a. Rav Chik, uh, excuse me, Chita says, Chik, says, excuse me, a person's soul will testify against him as it is stated in Micha 7.5. Keep the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. And some say, a man's limbs will testify against him as it says in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 10. You are my witnesses. Atem says the word of Hashem. Interesting. How can your soul testify against you? Are you not a soul? 
every human being is supposed to be a soul, so how can your soul testify against you? What does this Maimar Chazal mean over here? The Mechilta comes along in the passage from Isaiah and explains that the Bali Shuva, those who are returnees from a life of sin, they are called those who write for Hashem. It's a title for them. What do I mean? Let's take a look at the Mechilta here and expounds upon this concept. It says, regarding what is said there in Yeshayahu 44, verse 5, where it says, Zay yomer la Adonai ani v'zay, yichra v'shem, yacho v'zay, yichtov yado la Adonai, u'shem Israel yichane. One shall say, I am Hashem's, another shall call in the name of Yaakov, another shall mark his arm, literally right on his hand, and he should say, La Hashem, of Hashem, and in the name of Israel he shall be called. And therefore it comes along and says, he should be called, I am Hashem's, La Adonai Ani, I belong, I am to Hashem, I belong to Hashem. The Mechilta says, these are the fears of heaven untainted by sin. Another shall call in the name of Yaakov. It says that these are the minors. In other words, those who have died in childhood, the sons of the wicked of Israel. It says, another shall mark his arm of Hashem. When it says, Vizay, Yichtov Yadola Adonai. These, it says, are the Bali Shuva. And in the name of Israel, when it says, Ushem Israel, Yichane, it says, he shall be called. These are the righteous strangers who are gerim. In other words, these are alluding to converts over here. Now, contextually, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1 through 5 is about the chosen status of the Jewish people. Even though the Jewish people sinned and were punished by Hashem for their sins, they are still His chosen people. The Mechilta, in its commentary on this passage, explains that even though Israel sinned, that through Shuvah, the souls of Israel are considered sinless. And so in reference to the Bali Shuvah, who were described as, as writers of Hashem, which again, V'zei Yichtov Yadola Adonai, the Mechilta seems to be indicating that the reference to writing refers to the mitzvot of the Torah. In other words, the Bali Shuva are considered reborn through the performance of the mitzvot. And it's not that they physically write upon themselves. This is something that some from the Dead Sea Scroll community and the Qumran community used to do, specifically with the war with the Romans and individuals uh, in Masada. They were noted to kind of tattoo themselves, write down upon themselves, uh, uh, La Hashem, like, almost like the seat, the headband that was on the Kohen Haggadol, it said La Hashem, to Hashem, consecrated to God. Uh, they did this um, practice that they did. And so this passage here, in which the Mechilta alludes to, is not talking about a physical writing down, but it's talking about the performance of the mitzvot that is symbolically embedded upon the Bali Teshuvah when they perform the commandments of the Torah. Interesting. Over at Masechet Moe Katan, the sages explained that if you witness the death of a Jew, you are halakhically required to rip your clothes. Why? Because the death of a Jew is equivalent to the burning of a Sefer Torah. We read here in Moakatan 25a. It says, if one was standing there at the time of the soul's departure, at the time of death, he is also obligated to rend his clothes as is taught in the Baraita. Rav Shimon ben Elazar says, one who stands over the deceased at the time of the soul's departure is obligated to rip his clothes. To what may this be likened to? It says, to a Torah scroll that is burned, for which anyone present is obligated to rip his clothes. Interesting. Now Ramban Nachmanides, in his commentary to this Gemara, I should say to the Baraita that the Gemara quotes, explains that the soul of a Jew is likened to a Sefer Torah. We read here, Ramban's commentary, he says, it seems to me that the soul and the body is like the names of God that are written on the cloth, on the parchment of the scroll. It says, it is merely a mushal or a parable to convey the message that is a great loss and calls for alarm, and a person must tear his garments as if a Sefer Torah burned before him. Interesting. So what we learn from this Chazal and Ramban is that every part of a Sefer Torah is holy. 
That's one of the reasons why when a Torah has become so blemished, so puzzle, it's not repairable, we're required to bury it in the ground. Anything that has the cloth, the parchments, even tefillin, if you will, cloth and mezuzot, we're required to put those, bury them in the ground out of respect for the name of God. And so every part of a Sefer Torah is holy, yet it is the actual name of God or the titles of God, I should say, that are written in the Torah that infuses the Torah with Kedusha, with holiness. And so if we follow this analogy, that the entire body is holy and should be treated with holiness, what we learn is that the body is infused with holiness when the soul enters it. And so we learn what we learn from this concept is something very interesting, is that the body of an individual whose observance of mitzvot has a great sense of kedusha to it, similar to a Torah scroll. In fact, we learn a little bit more about this in greater detail over Masachet of Odozara regarding how the Romans killed Rabbi Hanina ben Tradian, Tradian, excuse me, and over there the Gemara tells us that the soul of Rabbi Hanina was like a safer Torah scroll. We read here in Masachet of Odozara 18a. It says, They found Rabbi Hanina ben Tradian, who was sitting and learning Torah and gathering crowds publicly. And there was a safer Torah in his arms. It says they took him, wrapped him in the Sefer Torah, surrounded him with branches, and lit the branches. Now, one of the reasons why Rav Hananiah was actually punished in this way is because Rome at that time had outlawed Judaism. Any observance of the mitzvot, if you were found with tefillin, anything, you were executed. So it deals with the ten martyrs that suffered underneath the Roman Empire. Rabbi Kiva was crucified, things of that nature. So it says that they surrounded him with branches and they lit the branches. And it says they brought sponges of cotton, soaked them in water, and placed them on his heart so that he would not die quickly. And his daughter said, Father, this is how I should see you. He said to her, If only they burned me, it would be difficult for me. Now that I am being burned with a Sefer Torah, he who will seek retribution for the desecration of the Sefer Torah will also seek retribution for my desecration. And he goes on to say afterwards that his disciples asked him, Rabbi, what do you see? And he said to them, the parchments are being burned, but the letters, the otiot, are flying away. And they said to him, you too should open your mouth and allow the fire to enter you. And he responded, it is better that the one who placed it remove it, but one may not destroy himself. May not destroy himself. Interesting, we see here that the Gemara mentions how the disciples, they actually came along and they asked them, what do you see? In other words, they saw the same thing, but they inquired about it to be given a better perspective of what was happening here. And so they figured, okay, well, just as the letters of God's name are flying off the scroll, likewise, you should open your mouth and let your neshama depart, right? And so what we see in this passage here is that just as you see the parchment burning, which is the physical embodiment of the Torah, but the spiritual essence, which are the letters that make up the titles of Hashem's names, they are flying away. Likewise, Rav Hanani's soul shall also fly upward and descend. But we see he says that he doesn't want to actually destroy himself. In other words, not to try to prematurely expedite the death process. So we see something very interesting here that just as the letters, the names of Hashem, sanctify the Sefer Torah, likewise the soul of a Jew is what sanctifies the body. Considering that the soul infuses the body with holiness, like the names of Hashem infuse the Sefer Torah with holiness, we read over in the Gemara, Masachet Nida, and mentions that when the soul enters the womb, it is taught Torah. This is brought down in Masachet Nida 30b. And it says, a fetus is taught the entire Kol HaTorah Kula, the entire Torah while in the womb, as is stated in Proverbs 4.4. 4, it says, And he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my mitzvot, and live. And it also said in Job chapter 29, verse 4, As I was in the days of my youth, when the converse of God was upon my tent. Interesting. If the soul is taught Torah in the womb, why do we have to study and learn Torah after birth? Why do we have to toil in it so much? Chazal tell us it's that when we get ready to exit the womb of our mother, a mala comes along 
and pops us right on the mouth and makes us forget the Torah that we learned in the womb. We read here in Nida 30b, continuing, it says that once the fetus emerges into the airspace of the world, it says that a malach comes and slaps it on the mouth, causing it to forget the entire Torah. As it says there in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, when a person enters the world, he is immediately liable, or excuse me, sin crouches at the entrance in which Hashem warned um, Cain about his sin. And so the Gemara expounds and says, when a person enters the world, he's immediately chayev, he's liable due to sin due to his loss of Torah knowledge because he doesn't have the proper tools. Okay, this is interesting. Who is this Malach that's responsible for making us forget Torah? I want to personally meet the guy because it's a real pain in the tuchus and it's quite a chutzpanik when you go through this life, you know, constantly studying Torah and forgetting what you learned five minutes ago and doing things you shouldn't be doing. I mean, it's caused a lot of sores in the world. So I'd like to know who this Malach is and give him a piece of my mind. We see here in this passage something interesting. The sages quoted directly from Genesis chapter 4, verse 7 which is once again the passage that Hashem warned Cain that the Yetzirah crouches at the door seeking entry into his life. What's interesting about the Gemara's quote of Genesis 4-7 is that it's also quoted over in Masechet Sanhedrin. What's unique, what's unique about the passage in Masechet Sanhedrin is that there's a debate between Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and Antoninus, which is Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And the whole debate is regarding when the Yetzirah first appears a man. And that passage is brought up there in Sanhedrin 91b. And it says, Antonina said to Rav Yehuda Hanasi, from when does the Yetzirah dominate a person? Is it from the moment of formation of the embryo or from the moment of emergence from the womb? And Rav Yehuda Hanasi said to him, it's from the moment of the formation of the embryo. Antonino said to him, okay, if so, the Yetzirah will cause the fetus to kick his mother's inwards and emerge from the womb. Rather, the Yetzirah dominates a person from the moment of emergence from the womb. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, Antoninus taught me this matter, and there is a pasuk that supports him. As is stated in Genesis 4, 7, sin crouches at the entrance, indicating that it is from the moment of birth when a newborn or the newborn emerges from the entrance of his mother's womb that the Yetzirah lurks. So what we learn from these two passages is that the Malach that hits us on the mouth and makes us forget all the Torah we learned in our mother's womb is none other than the Yetzahara. Now earlier, I quoted from Masechet Tanit that mentioned that on the Day of Judgment, our soul will testify before Hashem. There the Gemara mentioned the verse from Yeshayahu that said a person's limbs will act as witnesses. Atem adei ne'um Adonai. They will be witnesses on behalf of Hashem. We go back here to Tanit 11a. When it mentions over here, Rav Chikta said, a person's soul will testify against him. As is said in Micha 7, 5, keep the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. And some also say, a man's limbs will testify against him, as it says in Isaiah 43, verse 10, Atem, Atem, excuse me, Adei Neum Adonai, you are my witnesses, says Hashem. What we learn from this is that every time we sin, we damage the spiritual limbs of our soul, which is equivalent to damaging the letters in the Sefer Torah. For example, over in Parashat Pinchas, when the Torah describes the death of Zimri and mentions that Zimri, before he physically died, he was already dead spiritually due to his immoral relationship with Cosby. Take a look at the passage here in Numbers 25, verse 14. It says, V'shem ish Israel, the name of the Hamukhe Asher Hucha, the slain Jewish man who was slain. Here in this passage, the Torah repeats the verb Nacha, which means to be slain, to be stricken. And so it's a repetition. Why is it repeating itself? Well, the Torah wants to teach us that way before Pinchas physically killed Zimri, Zimri was already dead. The Or HaChaim comes along with a fascinating chidush on this passage and he explains. He says, when a human being sin, sins, excuse me, his soul becomes tarnished or injured in evil he cleaves to. When Zimri attached himself to Cosby, his soul became tarnished. This is what the Torah means when it describes him as a Jewish man that was makah, when he was wounded by a fatal blemish way before before Pinchas afflicted bodily death upon him. 
or Hachaim goes on to say, the repetition of the word Nacha in Hamu Che Asher Chuka is to teach us for all practical purposes that Zimri was already wounded before Pinchas killed him. The moment Zimri attached himself to Cosby, his soul received a fatal injury. When the Torah says Asher Chuka at Hamidianit, that he was slain with the Midianite woman, it is to inform us that Zimri's soul was struck down because of his intimate association with Cosby, the Midianite woman. His union with her fatally wounded his neshama, fatally wounded his soul. Now what's fascinating is that in modern Hebrew, the word nake means handicap. And so what we learn from this is that our sins cause us to become spiritually handicapped, to make us spiritually impotent. This is a very powerful concept that most people don't realize that when something physically happens to them in this world, that that physical action simply is paralleling what has already spiritually transpired to them. But because they're so desensitized and out of tune of their connection with Hashem, they don't realize that they have already been spiritually afflicted. And so you might be thinking, well, what in the world does this reveal in relation to the three books mentioned in the Gemara of Rosh Hashanah? Well, friends, it reveals that there are no literal books being open on Rosh Hashanah. There's no literal book of Siddiquim or Rashaim or Benonim that are open before Hashem of Rosh Hashanah. The books of the wicked, the righteous, and the Benonim are nothing but metaphors for the different types of Jewish souls in relation to the Torah. Each Jew is considered a living, safer Torah. As a nation, each Jew collectively represents one letter in the Torah. What do I mean? According to a scribal tradition, there are 600,000 otiot, or letters, in the Torah. At Har Sinai, there were 600,000 Jewish people who received the Torah. In fact, what's interesting is that the name Israel, Yud Shin Reish Alev Lamed, is an acronym that spells out Yishishin Ribaot Od Le Torah, that there are 600,000 letters in the Torah. Rabbi Sadoch HaKon explains that the soul of every Jew is a Torah. He says, in the merit of, the, of Torah study, does, excuse me, but the merit of Torah study does not come to fruition the same way as prayer does with an increase of influence. Rather, its merit increases automatically through Torah study, for it is the root of potential abundance for all Jewish souls. For it is known that their roots, their root is in the Torah because there are 600,000 letters representing these 600,000 souls. While each letter is different from the rest and each person has his own portion in Torah, nevertheless his portion does not limit him to other areas of Torah. And learning Torah serves to unite all portions of Torah. So what this indicates is that every time a Jew violates a mitzvah, he erases the letter of the mitzvah that he violated from his soul, which makes it easier for him to sin or to transgress that prohibition in Torah. Or if he continues to become lazy in doing a positive mitzvah, that laziness being repeated over and over will cause him to neglect the actual positive mitzvah. Now we understand when the Gemara teaches about the three books in Rosh Hashanah and mentions how the wicked are blotted out from the book of life. The book of life is the Torah. Yimachu mi sefer chayim, David Amalek says, blot them from out of the book of the living. Ve'im sedekin el yikatevu, and let them not be inscribed with the righteous. By violating the Torah, the soul of a Jew has no portion in God's book of life, which is the Torah itself. The Torah itself, we go here, Rosh Hashanah 16b. Rav Avin said, what is the verse that alludes to this? Psalm 69, 29, David Amalek says, Yim Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, but not be written with the righteous. Let them be blotted out of the Misefa, the book. This is the book of the completely wicked, who are blotted out from the, from the world. Chaim of the living, this refers to the completely righteous. However, when it says, do not let them be written with the righteous, well, this refers to the Benonim, to those in between, 
who are written in a separate book, not with the righteous. And once again, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak then comes along and says, we learn the matter from the Pasuk over in Exodus 32, 32, in which Moshe said afterwards, V'im ein machini na misafracha. And now if not, you don't forgive them, then blot me out, I pray, out of your book, which, is what you, which you have written. Blot me out, Rav Nachman says. Okay, machini na, well, this refers to the book of the completely wicked. Misafracha, from your book, well, that refers to the book of the completely righteous. And it also, the, and it says that, which is a special, which is special and attributed to God. And also which you have written, well, that refers to the Benoni, that refers to those who are in between. When Moshe asks Hashem, Machini na misafracha, to please blot me from out of your book, to blot me out of your Torah, Hashem said, Lo, not going to happen. Mi asher chatali, only the Jewish soul who sins against me, and mechanu misafre, God says, I will blot him out of my book. I want to point out that when Rav Nachman interprets the words Machini na misafracha asher katafta, that you shall please blot me out from out of your book that you have written, that it's a remez to three different types of Jews. He mentions that the last part over here, asher katafta, that you have written, that refers to the book of the Benonim. The Benonim are souls who are compared to Torah scrolls that are worn out, to letters that are faded away. And therefore, if the Benonim are not careful in fixing the blemished letters or their sins, it can make them puzzle, it can make them invalid. And they risk permanently erasing the letters from being read, which means they risk damaging their souls forever, God forbid. This is very important that we learn that every soul is equivalent to a letter in the Torah. And therefore, if we treat our observance of the Torah lightly, it's because of what we do with our souls when we actually engage in various transgressions. I'm reminded of a passage that's brought down in the Midrash uh, regarding Rabbi Meir. There was a discussion amongst the sages and they were darshaning the Pasuch in the Torah when God created garments of skin for Adam and Chava. And there the Midrash mentions that there was an alternative reading in a Torah scroll, Rabbi Meir. We read here in Breshi Rabbah, chapter 2012. It says in uh, Genesis, chapter 3, verse 21, or excuse me, Vayalbi Shem. And Hashem Elohim made for Adam and his wife garments of skin. However, the Midrash says, However, in the Torah of Rabbi Meir, they found written garments of light, not garments of skin. Now, if you could read Hebrew, you'll see I left two phrases highlighted in yellow, ketonet or and ketonet or. They sound exactly the same. However, there's a difference. The first passage, ketonet or, is spelled ein vavresh. And the letter Ein Vavresh means skin. However, the last passage, Ketonet Or, is Alev Vavresh. Alev Vavresh Or means light. Now, both Alev and Ein, by the way, are guttural letters. They come from the back of the throat. They're also considered silent, okay? And therefore, they sound identical. But obviously, they have a different connotation when spelled out. And so, what we see here is that the Midrash mentions that in the Torah scroll, it says that God created garments of skin for Adam and Eve. But yet, in a Torah scroll belonging to Rabbi Meir, it doesn't say garments of skin, it says garments of light. What does this mean? Well, Rabbi Meir did not find the phrase ketonet or, garments of light, in some type of old Sefer Torah that goes all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu, going all the way back to Avraham Avinu. No. Instead, when the Midrash says, In the Torah of Rabbi Meir, It is discovered that it is written, Garments of light. It's actually referring to the soul of Rabbi Meir. In fact, the name Meir in Hebrew means from light. And therefore, Rabbi Meir understood that Adam HaRishon was originally a garment of light. And every soul that walks in purity with Hashem is also a garment of light. However, 
Our sins cause that ketonin ore, that garment of life, to be covered with ketonin ore, a garment of skin. We become opaque. It's only when we do teshuva that we are able to rectify our sin or rectify the blemished letters of the Sefer Torah that we have damaged. And so what we learn here in conclusion of this shiur is that when Hashem opens books, as the Gemara says, a Masachat Rosh Hashanah, that everyone and their mother has possibly heard at one time or another being taught in the synagogue, these are not literal books, they're metaphors. The question is, which book are you? Are you the book of the righteous? Are you the book of the wicked, God forbid? Or are you someone who are a benoni? You're someone who's in between. The dangers of being a benoni is that if you're not careful, the Torah becomes faded in time. And everyone knows to have a kosher Torah, you need to make sure you have a nice sofa stam who's able to rectify those blemished letters. We must learn to become a sofer stam, in which we repair, we rectify the damages, the blemishes. That way that they may look inside our Torah, like Rabbi Meir, and they see a Torah of light. Not a Torah that's opaque, that's blemished, that's faded away. Because when you damage a Torah scroll, a Torah scroll is irreparable. It has to be buried. You have to say zaygazut to it, and it's buried. What happens to the Benoni, the Gemara says, is that they have until Yom Kippur to patch up the damages. And God then seals the faith of that individual for the up and coming year, which is only Hashem knows the outcome of what's going to happen to them. And as I explained in my previous teaching, titles like Sadiq in Russia, they only reflect the outcome of a person based upon the judgment in the heavenly court. And so, Chavarim, I would like to challenge you. This Rosh Hashanah, when Hashem looks at you, He's looking at you as if He's studying a Torah scroll. He's studying your soul. You have to determine exactly which book you are. Are you with the Siddiquim, which is the book of life, which is the Torah, which means you are living the Torah. You are thinking the Torah. You are a living Torah, essentially. essentially. Or, if you're just a violator of the Torah, you know, I'm, I'm a Russia, right? In a sense, okay, fine, this is the outcome, let it be. God have mercy upon your soul, God forbid, if such a thing, or if a person should think such a way. But for most people, they're benonim, they're in between. That's the average person. And they think if they could swing it to the left a little, swing it to the right a little bit, right? Swing the merit, uh, the midah tadin to midah chachesit, they can fare well in judgment, only to come back around next year at the same time. It's not, it's not worth being a Benoni all the time. We have to strive to be righteous. We have to strive to be living in the Torah. The Torah itself is the book of life. This is also why I say there's no such thing as cultural Judaism for people in North America. You're either identifying with the Torah or you're not identifying with the Torah. And so Chavarim, as Hashem is analyzing our deeds and our thoughts in relation to His Torah, may we all be found worthy to be written in that book of life. May we be found worthy to merit the blessing of the mitzvot of the Torah in this world and also in the world to come. And so, Chavarim, if our organization is a blessing to you, our teachings are a challenge to you, prayerfully consider donating to us financially. You can find the links to donate directly below the video where it says see more. You can follow the link directly to our website. And there we also have an address if you'd like to send a check. We thank you for your support, or you have the option of donating via PayPal, and that link is directly below as well. So we thank you for your financial support. We thank you for your prayers. And if you ever have any questions you would like to ask regarding some of the topics I share here, please feel free to send me an email at rabbi at 70 facesoftorahcom I will get to those in the order that they come in. Once again, Chavarim, thank you for taking the time out to study with me. And the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, bless you and your families. Shalom, Lashana Tova, Chatzameh, and Kotu.